and the next speaker we go now to uh, back to United Kingdom and to Bradford to Bradford Teaching Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and we welcome Professor Farouk Ganchi. Hello, Farouk. Hello to Bradford. Uh, hi, uh, Stefan. Thank you for having me on this uh, spaceship of yours. Uh, it's a very pl our very pleasure, especially if you read your title very short, and I know you worked until the very last minute on your presentation. And am I right? It's how to become rich? Uh, of course it is. Um, <laughs> but I need to work with you to find that out. Exactly. So we are looking forward how to become rich. Well, rich stands here for the retina in a choroid and we talk about imaging this very entity in the macular clinics. Sure. Um, as I said, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, coming back to your busy clinics uh, and, and seeing lots of patients in your clinic for macular degeneration, especially in how to figure it out, what we're dealing with. And you rely especially on the OCT scans these days to figure out what is going on. Um, so we, basically the imaging is used to figure out whether there is a tissue degeneration, especially retinal neurodegeneration in a patient sitting in front of you, secondary to macular degeneration. We have heard some beautiful talks, well illustrated with examples. And I'm going to share some of the examples from our clinic. So, Imaging is used, first of all, to diagnose the condition and then to figure out what the prognosis would be for that condition for you, your clinic staff, and especially for your patient and their relatives. We also figure, want to figure out what the treatment response could be or should be so, so as to assess as we go along treating our patient, and then we can predict what the outcome of the treatment would be for the patients as well. Um, so going forwards, what, what we do is we look at the structure of the retina using the OCT scan, looking at the reflectance difference between the various parts of the retinal tissue, both in health and how it changes with the disease, in particular, the macular degeneration in our case here. Um, so you would be relying on your technician, whichever format you use in your own clinics, uh, whether it, that is um, a trained photographer taking the pictures or whether it is your um, it is your uh, nursing staff or you have trained technicians taking pictures but they need to be aware of what is required to be photographed which part of the retina or macula in particular um, and, and that is going on while you are sitting in your own clinic uh, looking at the patient's chart the images are taken and transferred to your screen. So you could be looking at picture like this. And as Robert quite eloquently uh, pointed out, is that the area that you're interested in is just around that high reflective band in the outer retina, which is your Brooks RPE complex. And that's where you see the drusenoid changes. In this case, as Robert pointed out, is reticular drusen. And you can figure out there may be other types of drusen, soft drusen, or there may be even more a dramatic presentation of drusen like this one, which can extend all the way up to the retinal periphery. Each one of them has a different significance for your patient and the prognosis. For example, the reticular drusen is associated both with geographic atrophy as well as neovascular macular degeneration. As Robert pointed out, the soft drusen could be associated with the coalescence of the drusen and then progress on to the wet macular degeneration. Uh, the atrophy that takes place also can be predicted based on the uh, drusen structure that you see. It's not only the drusen type, but within what you see within drusen, that is also important. Um, a little bit slow with my progression of this slide, so just bear with me. So as I, as I was pointing that out, that you want to look at the structure within uh, the drusen itself. Here, 
you can see that there's a large coalescent drusen. Uh, there is some subretinal fluid that was pointed out in the earlier talk as well. But you can see what happens to the patient with time. So it may be my network collect connection, but it's rather slow in progression for the slides. Um, can that be done from the command center, please, uh, Rob? Stefan? Can we? Thank you. So as you can see, the same patient progression here, you can see there are more in the next, please, more uh, uh, hyperreflective spots seen in this patient, as was pointed out in the previous talk. And these hyperreflective foci are prognostic features for the progression to atrophy. In this case, you can see there is subretinal fluid collection as well. So there is a suspicion of uh, neovascular change taking place. And the next slide, please. And as was pointed out, the hyperreflective foci, as pointed out by the arrow here, goes on to lead to geographic atrophy. In this case, there are two further pictures taken two years uh, apart. And you can see on the bottommost picture, there's already full uh, cora developed that is a complete outer retinal and retinal pigment epithelial atrophy or geographic atrophy as we used to know before. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, here's another example which looks like a, a huge pigment epithelial detachment. And the next, please. And on top of that, you can see there is hyper reflective uh, foci collection that was change in the IPE. And on top of that, you might see a small intraretinal fluid-like appearance. And the, the bottom picture of the same pic patient scan at the different level shows there is some hyper-reflective collection within that uh, PED. Uh, next, please. Now, that hyper-reflective collection within the PED is similar to the drusen that is seen under the star here. And the next, please. So how do you figure out whether there is a neovascular membrane sitting under the pigment epithelial detachment, or is it just a drusenoid, large drusenoid collection? And one of the things that you can try in the clinic is to adjust the contrast uh, on the OCT scan itself. And the next, please. And if you tone down the contrast, you would find, and the next, please, you'd find that the material within the PED has this almost the same reflectance in the next as the drusen seen under the star. So that kind of a, gives you indication that it is a drusenoid material within that PED rather than a fiber vascular component. Of course, as Roberto had pointed out in his talk, you would like to confirm that with an OCTA scan, which we had done in this case. So what are the bio, bio, biomarkers for the neovascular macular degeneration? Again, this has been pointed out time and again. So you look for the presence of fluid, both intraretinal or subretinal fluid. You look at the hyperreflective material, uh, subretinal hyperreflective material or SRAM, and there is subretinal hyperreflective exudation as well that you can look at as pointed out by the star in this case here. Let me see. And if you've done the OCTA scan on this patient, as example here, the on fast clearly shows a vascular network sitting uh, in the macular region, confirming a diagnosis of neovascular macular degeneration. Um, and the next, please. Uh, uh, here's an example of a pigment epithelial detachment. Again, you see hyperreflective material within that pigment epithelial detachment. Next, please. And the flow signal clearly shows that there are uh, some abnormal flow markers within that pigment epithelial detachment. If you go to the next, please, again, and you see a vascular network on on fast image confirming neovascular macular degeneration. One of the things to point out here is if you look at the pigment epithelial detachment scan, it shows that there is hyperreflective material on the ceiling, just under the ceiling of the pigment epithelial detachment. That is, that is a kind of a telltale sign for a neovascular change within that PED. Let me try if I can move with my pointer, sorry. Next, please. So when you're sitting in front of a patient, you, you're going through this series of scans and, and analyzing what is going on. You would be looking at picture like this, for example, and the next, please. 
and you and you instantly figure out what is going on. You find that there is subretinal hyperreflective material collected. That's where your eyes are focused. At the next, please. And you pick up the other signs next, such as some hyperreflectivity within that material. And the next, some possible intraretinal or subretinal fluid. The next, please. And the next. And you find just under the hyperreflective uh, band, that is your Brooks NRPE complex, the chorio capillary is a kind of compressed with kind of opaque vessels. The next slide, please. And that's quite important. But what you need to focus on, not just those areas, but surrounding areas in the hyperreflective band. And you find that here, there is a shallow pigment epithelial detachment, as was pointed out in the previous talk. Next slide, please. And you've got to confirm that there is no neovascular complex there. And OCTA scan, lo and behold, confirms that there is uh, a, a neovascular complex in that shallow pigment epithelial detachment, not under the sh SRAM or subretinal hyperreflective material that we were focusing on. Um, and the next slide, please. So we have followed up this patient over six months. And what you find that the SRAM has gradually disappeared, you still have a shallow pigment epithelial detachment where you see a kind of a double layer sign if you pay attention to that. Next, please. That one. And the next. And as I said, the SRAM has disappeared. There are pachy vessels still present. And if you go on to the next slide, please, for me. And what you find is that the neovascular network that we had identified at baseline is still present. Now, it's been said that macular new vessels, non exudative can be present in up to 6% of the cases uh, and between 6 and 25% of the cases in the fallow eyes. And they may not need any treatment in majority of the cases. However, they do require close follow-ups just in case they were to become exudative. In this particular case, we might say that the patient had some kind of exudation. However, that involuted on its own and did not require any treatment. The patient continues to have regular follow-ups. The next slide, please. And here's another example. The patient was diagnosed with a central serous retinopathy. If you look at the outer retina, which is the area of focus for us, there is a subretinal fluid collection. You might say that there is some SRAM and a shallow pigment epithelial detachment. Pachy vessels in the choroid has been mentioned before. And if you look at this slide, next slide, please. And this is the patient at follow-up few months down the line. The subretinal fluid has settled down. However, what you find is the patient has more undulating uh, pigment epithelial detachment with some pancake-like appearance, at least in one of the undulation. Uh, next, please. And when we did the NOCTA scan, it found a network of blood vessels. So if this patient didn't have the OCTA scan, we wouldn't have picked up a macular new vessels. So patient had exudative uh, change six months prior to being seen in our clinic where the fluid had disappeared, but you can find the macular new vessels still present. So it is difficult to, to be absolutely certain that in all the cases of CSR, we don't have macular new vessels. And it would be useful if you can start practicing um, looking at um, macular new vessels in patients with CSR as well. So the next slide, please. So that, that, that was going on before the patient was seen in our clinic. So one thing I want to point out here is if you look at the thickness of pigment epithelial detachment at baseline when subretinal fluid was present compared to when the patient was seen for the OCTA scan six months later, there is a definite thickening or swelling of the pigment epithelial detachment at, at that stage. And that is a, another useful marker to remember in your clinical practice. The next slide, please. And the next, please. So when you, when you want to see your patient for follow-up and predicting that treatment response, what sort of activity markers you look for? And obviously you'll be looking for the fluid intraretinal or subretinal fluid presence or absence of, or increase or decrease of that fluid, hemorrhage, Again, it's a sign of a new or fresh activity. Exudates on the whole describes a, a long-standing change. And I already mentioned about the SRAM, the SHE, that is the subretinal hyperreflective or exudative material. 
and hyperreflective foci uh, and dots. The next, please. And the next. So in this case, I'm showing the example of patient before and after treatment. So if you continue, please, okay, next slide and the next. And you see the increase in fluid with the treatment, the fluid starts disappearing. And the next slide, please. And the change I want to point out is the difference in the height of pigment epithelial detachment. As the activity increases, you can see there is increase in the pigment epithelial detachment swelling. The next slide, please. And the next. So again, the same point to reiterate here, the patient with subretinal fluid and the shallow pigment epithelial detachment at the top, that's where the injection was given. The fluid disappears. And the next slide, please, after the injection. But if you see the height of pigment epithelial detachment, and the next slide, please, it was higher when there was disease was active. And the next, please. And the next, uh, keep going, sorry. So one of the things that we point out is the presence of elongation of retinal photoreceptors, the like, uh, like substellicities, and they indicate the pigment epithelia are still alive and surviving, provided we can get rid of the fluid underneath, the, the photoreceptors would settle down and the visual equity can still be gained. Next slide, please. And the next. It's a similar example where the photoreceptors are elongated so with CSR, and as the fluid disappears, they all settle down and the photoreceptor integrity can be reestablished and vision can be regained as we see in all, all of our patients. And the next slide, please. And the next. So in some of the patients, we find chronic changes of scarring, such as outer retinal tubulations, which is disruption of your photoreceptors. So that is a bad prognostic sign, as we all know. The next couple of slides, please, and then we'll finish. Uh, continue. And this is the example of a patient that you've seen in your clinic where you find the patient has central retinal atrophy. When you do autofluorescence, there is a lack of central autofluorescence in both eyes, bilaterally symmetrical. So this patient is not uh, macular degeneration, but in fact, it's a macular dystrophy patient. And the next patient? Sometimes you refer patients with suspected diagnosis of CSR, and what you find, interestingly, is not actually uh, CSR or any macular degeneration. It may simply be choroidal excavation, as in, in this case, with a uh, choroidal uh, cave or uh, absence of choroidal kind of a coloboma. The next slide, please. Just I want to show a couple of slides on what the new possibilities would be with OCT scanning with Heidelberg in future. And this is a 20 hertz scan, which provides a very detailed scan of both the retina and the choroid. And the next slide, please. And then we have a standard 85 hertz scan that we currently have in use, but again, with very high definition, that certainly would improve our ability to pick up even the smallest changes in the retina. And the next, and this is the new, more exciting possibility, even faster, 125 hertz, uh, scanning, which is going to be very useful for the OCTA scanning, very rapid. And the next slide, please. And the next. And the EDI are both with 25 hertz. Beautiful pictures. Again, the next one. And the next. What I'm trying to show here is the standard OCTA scan we get is with 85 hertz. That's the quality of details we get. Beautiful as it is. But to get a faster scan where the patient is moving their eyes, you need a faster rates. And here is an example of that. Next slide, please. And at 125, uh, you can acquire the scan very quickly without any significant loss of the details. And this is something that we look forward to having in our macular clinics as we go along. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Farouk. And uh, because of the time, I can allow one question, which is coming from Roberto, and I ask you for a short answer, please. Sure. Excellent presentation, Farouk, as, as usual. I was remembering yesterday there was some concern about how clinically relevant it is to increase resolution. Uh, so you have shown a lot of images. Sure. Do you think I... is it clinically relevant? No, I suppose that, that, that remains to be seen. There are, there are cases where you would need to have high definition, especially the cases with macular dystrophy or 
the masquerade is an atypical case is where you would be relying on better quality images. And rather than just having the better quality images, what we need to also look forward to, especially in the macular degeneration patients, is a quicker acquisition of the images as well. So that is where the 125 hertz images would be very useful. The image acquisition time is going to be a lot shorter. Within seconds, you get a good quality image without any compromise in the quality. And that is going to be very important. While the 20 hertz images, they're going to be more for research to start with, I think. Excellent. I think we can add another chapter to our um, uh, AMD compendium uh, with this talk, and I congratulate you for that. Thank you so much.